Susan Atkins is 28 now. She's just ended her first seven years of a life term. She has spent five of them here at the County Women's Institution in San Bernardino County. She's just had her first parole hearing and been turned down. But the people who work with her here say that she's made a remarkable change in the last two years. They say she's become a devout Christian, and she says she wants only to serve God. Susan Atkins feels that her horrifying experience with drugs can be a lesson to those that use them or think about using them. Today, she says her bizarre behavior was born out of Manson's evil persuasiveness and fed by her constant drug use. During her Manson years, Susan Atkins dropped acid at least 300 times, and she smoked, swallowed, shot up, and snorted every other drug in sight. And although she had no drugs in her first five years of imprisonment, she says it took her that long to fully regain her consciousness, to even begin to realize what she had done. She hasn't spoken with a reporter since the trial in 1970. She got word to me that she wanted to talk about the dangers of drug use, that she also wanted to reveal something new about the murders. What happened that night you all went to Sharon Tate's house? What really happened? Well, I remember getting in the car with Tex. And Tex my, Watson. Tex Watson and my other two co-defendants. Three co-defendants, actually. Um, and before I ever got in the car, Tex and I had our own special little stash of uh, cocaine. You know, I think it was cocaine or methadrine, I'm not sure which. And we were speed and we both snorted some speed and got in the car. We were very, very wired. Mm. And we drove to the house uh, with instructions to kill everyone in the house. From Charlie? Yeah. Um, and not just that but that we were instructed to go all the way down every house, hit every house on the... On the street? On the street, yes. And kill all the people kill in all those the houses? all people in all those houses. Um, and we went into the house, and I remember that... As we went in, uh, a car came up to the driveway and I remember Tex getting out, and without saying anything, they were gunned by a sh shot. I was in the bushes, and... Uh, That's when the young boy, Stephen Parent, was, right, was killed. In the right. car, outside. Right. The people in the house were all brought into the living room and tied up, and... I remember that... Wojtek Bukowski, I believe is his name, I had tied his hands with a towel, and then was instructed to kill him. And I raised the knife that I had in my hand, and I couldn't put the knife down. I, I, could not, I couldn't bring it down. It was just as though there was a force there that held my wrist, and I couldn't, I couldn't move. And as he saw that I couldn't move, then he very easily undid the ties, the towel that I tied his wrist with, and he and I began to fight. And I remember I was screaming for help, and he was screaming for help, and uh, then Tex came and helped me, and I was left to sit and watch Sharon Tate. And about that time, it, I can remember seeing people just scattering in different places and running in different places, and I was left sitting with Sharon Tate, and she was talking to me. And I remember that I had absolutely, I could have, I felt nothing. I felt absolutely nothing for her um, as she begged for her life and for the life of her baby. And uh, I remember when we first went in, uh, one of the people said, who are you? And Tex said, I'm the devil and I'm here to do the devil's business. And I remember that in my conscience, it, it's so alive in me, even just recalling it. I remember that I had gone so far and there was no turning back. There, even if I had wanted to run, even if I had wanted to leave, I couldn't. It was like I was caught in something that I had no control over. I had absolutely no say-so as to what was happening there. I was just like a tool in the hands of the devil is the only way I can put it. 
and I believe that it was by the grace of God that my hand did not go down with that knife on Wojciech Lajkowski's chest. I believe that... Uh, well, who did kill those people? That night? Yeah. Tex. Mm. Well, I can ask you now, what, what did Tex really do there? Of what I saw happening in Tex. The way he moved, the viciousness and cold um, it was just like seeing somebody go crazy with more power than I've ever seen anybody. I don't think he was in control of himself. I think that he was in their own human strength could do what Tex did. Well, Charles night. Manson was in control of him, right? Yeah, as far as giving orders, but I don't think Charles Manson's mind was in control of Texas mind that night. I think that it was a higher power than that. Charlie's human too, you know, and his mental uh, powers are just as limited, maybe not as limited as other humans, but that there was an evil force in control of Tex that night. Well, it was in control he, of all of yeah, obviously. He, yeah, he did things that... You've heard stories, I'm sure, of people who have lifted up cars off of other people, how they have superhuman strength. Well, Tex had that kind of strength that night. Uh, but not for good. It was for evil. It's harming and hurting people. Just... I only saw him kill those people, and then I've heard later that he has said himself that he was responsible for all the deaths. At the Tate House? At the Tate House, yes. Are you trying to lay the blame off on him? No. No. Then what exactly. do you think is the point of this? That the truth be told, that the truth be made known. I tried to take blame from Tex and from Charlie and from Pat and from Leslie by taking and saying that I had killed Sharon Tate and that I had killed Gary Hinman. I tried to take some of the blame and put it on myself because I thought that was my part at that point, and that was a lie, and... In this room were all the survivors of those victims, of yours and the others, their families and their friends. What would you say to them? Well, about me now is that I'm not the woman that I was in 1969. I'm a new creature in Christ. Uh, I've been completely spiritually, mentally, and almost physically born again, though my outside is not changed all that much, the inside of me has changed. Uh, that I love them with a love that I don't think any words that I could tell them could express, but only by living a life that may help somebody else by preventing maybe somebody else from going down the same road, by preventing other survivors of such a terrible thing is the only way that I could say what I would have to say to them. I just love them. I feel for them. I feel their pain. I feel their, their sorrows and, and their loss. And I didn't feel that years ago. I didn't feel anything for him. I still feel pain when I think about her and that she's not here, and I don't think that anything that I could say could ease that pain in any of the survivors' hearts. And only God can take care of that. Only God can give them an assurance that their loved ones are with him, and I believe that with my whole heart. I believe that those people that died that night are with God, and if they're at peace, and it's the only thing that I can tell them. And I believe that with my whole heart. And that by the grace of God, the survivors will also see their loved ones again one day. You'd have to understand what acid does to the mind in order to understand how a person can get confused behind drugs. And that's... I would take a thesis writing a book 
on what LSD can do to the mind. But, um, but it was powerful enough to uh, keep you sure, in the fog for sure. all those years, even after you sure. stopped I using used to, I used to think that you came down off an acid trip after 12 hours. That's not true. Every time you take LSD, you, the moral fiber of your character, which is in, uh, put in you or uh, when you grow up, everybody grows up with different morals according to their culture. Okay, when you take acid, your mind expands beyond these moral characteristics and your concepts of right and wrong. So you step out beyond those bounds, and when you step out beyond those bounds, the imagination begins to take over. And the imagination can be a very deceitful thing. It's a fantasy. And when you take acid, you go out beyond that, you think you're coming back to where you started from. Originally, you don't. And every time you drop acid, you get a little bit further away from reality. And I took so much acid that I just was what I would term spaced. And it took me many years to what I term now re-enter. And that was just through not having any acid and having to deal with reality every day. Well, you say you're operating from a sense of complete consciousness now and reality. But looking back from this point for you, what you were and what you did must be terrifying. Yes to realize that by my own free will, I willingly got into something that completely took control over me, that I lost control of myself behind drugs and um, de a process of deprogramming, losing my morals. It wasn't just drugs, it was Charles Manson's persuasiveness, too. Well, yeah, there was a lot of deprogramming that, went in, that was involved in that. Uh, you take away a person's conscience of right and wrong by telling them when they're under LSD or any mind-expanding drug, there's no such thing as guilt. And you've already come to a place in your mind or your imagination where uh, you don't like the feeling of guilt, so it's easy to say, yeah, there's no such thing as guilt. I'll believe there's no such thing as guilt, therefore I can do anything and not feel guilty about it. Can you understand why many people, perhaps most people outside, are going to feel that you don't deserve parole, that you should never be given parole? You're aware of that? Yes. Well, so what if you spend the rest of your life in this prison? Then I spend the rest of my life in this prison. Um, is that thought depressing to you, though? No, because I know that, um, how can I put it, I'm content. How does it come about? How does peace come about, my peace? Mm -hmm. Well, I found peace through salvation in Jesus. And just knowing that I've been forgiven by God is sufficient for me. And the fact that you know out there people probably can't forgive you. Yes. Has, has no effect on you? Uh, no. Uh, because they're not the ones that I have to face in the end when I die. I have to face God, and it's His forgiveness that determines my peace. At 21, Susan Atkins was center stage in the crime of the century. Now, seven years later, she says her life has come to a better purpose. Without that, she probably wouldn't have lived. Or as a reporter wrote during the trial, Susan Atkins looked like she might start screaming someday and never stop. Every night when I go to sleep, I know there's no pretending. There's no, uh, there's no undoing. There's no wiping it out. There's no whitewashing it. It's there, it's a fact, it happened, and I was a part of it. I feel that there are eight lives that had I not been involved, they may still be alive today. Eight worthwhile human beings who had the right to live, and they're no longer alive. And that's something that I live with every day. I cannot, I'm sorry. I've spoken the truth as I've talked to you. 
And the truth is, I never killed anybody. I lied at the grand jury. I lied at the trial and said that I killed people that I, in fact, did not. I live with that knowledge. I live with the fact that people think that I killed a pregnant woman eight and a half months pregnant. How had Charlie instructed you to behave when this was happening? Mercilessly, coldly and brutally terrorizing people. I wasn't instructed to show any mercy. Deputy District Attorney Stephen Kay. Uh, the motive of the Manson family was to attain uh, political power in the United States. They wanted to start a race war between blacks and whites. Manson and the family would at least rule the United States. It was never clear if they were going to rule the world, but it, at least the United States. On a hot August night in 1969, part of the Manson family, Susan Atkins, Tex Watson, and Patricia Krenwinkel, carried out what the prosecutor later called the most horror-filled hour of murder in American criminal history. At Sharon Tate's house over there, they butchered five people. Susan Atkins confessed during her trial that they kept Sharon until last to make her suffer. She was eight and a half months pregnant. Everybody was terrified. It was a terrifying, horrible... Can we not talk about this? This is really hard for me to talk about it. Well, Susan Atkins was the actual killer of Sharon Tate. One of the worst things that she did was during the course of the, uh, uh, the stabbing, uh, she drank Sharon Tate's uh, blood. And uh, she said that she was so turned on by the, uh, the murder and drinking the blood that she had an orgasm. The district attorney says you drank Sharon Tate's blood. I never did that. I the district that. attorney says that you said it was better than orgasm. I never said that to the district attorney. Sharon Tate uh, uh, was asking for uh, God and, uh, and her mother and just pleading for her baby. She said, all I want is to have my baby. She begged and she begged and she begged. And Susan Atkins' reply again was, shut up, bitch, you're going to die. The court transcripts show that you said, shut up, bitch, I'm going to kill you. The first time that I saw her, I could have taken her by the neck and just broke every bone in her body, just thrown her down, you know? They have proven they cannot live in, in a society with other people. I don't know that Mrs. Tate could ever forgive me. My hope is that someday she will, not as a means for me to be released, but as a means for her to find some peace. I know the pain and the suffering that I caused Mrs. Tate. The tears are fake. I feel that uh, Susan Atkins is um, a Sarah Bernhardt on the stage. A classy little actress. A classy little actress, absolutely. You know, I had to forgive myself, and that's not something that I did overnight. That's not something that I think I've totally accomplished. It's a day-by-day -day process. There are times when I lay and I cry because of what I did, because of the pain that I caused so many people. She says she feels, but she has not said she's sorry for what she did. I haven't heard this woman say, I am truly sorry for what I did. Can you get out the words and say to Sharon Tate's parents that you're sorry for what you did that night? <sighs> you ask hard questions. There are no words to describe what I feel. I'm sorry. Uh, please forgive me. Those words are so overused and inadequate for what I feel. I know that I would not want, if my son were brutally murdered, I would not want to walk around hating every day of my life somebody for killing my child. It may not be hate, Susan. Maybe people can't understand you, the fact that you were involved in I those killings. I don't understand myself.
and the fact that I was involved in those things Could 16, you 17 years ago. But I understand what you're saying, that people cannot understand. They look at me and they see this, they see me as I sit here today. I look in the mirror and I find it difficult to believe that I was ever involved in something like that. You mean they think you're a monster? Yeah, a and devil. I'm not. I'm not. I'm a human being. I'm a human being that got caught up in drugs. I'm a human being that got caught up into listening to a maniac. And I followed him and I hurt and destroyed a lot of lives, but I'm still a human being. I still feel if you cut me, I will bleed. Television preacher Father Michael Manning is telling his nationwide audience it's time to set her free. If they let her out, who could possibly take responsibility for her? I'd be willing to. Um, I've known Susan and I've spoken to the parole board that I'd be willing to give her a job. I, I believe that Susan has changed and I'm not afraid that of sitting in my desk and all of a sudden her coming with a knife and that, that's a thing of the past. It's, it's a shame. It's a shame that a woman like Susan, who has all of these talents and who has all of this need to make reparation, for you will, if you will, for what she's done, that she can't. Uh, society won't allow her. Society won't forgive her. And that, that's a real bother to me. Your life, even before Charlie Manson, was not pretty. No, it wasn't. I didn't have a, what you would call an ideal upbringing. I'm the child of two alcoholic parents. I'm a victim of incest. Uh, my mother died when I was 14. I did not do good in school. Uh, I ran away when I was 18 and went to the city. And My brain was fried. I probably had over 350 LSD experiences, separate individual experiences in less than a year and a half. I smoked marijuana on a daily basis anywhere from two or three joints to a lid. Did he once seem like a god to you? He had, um, he captured my attention by the power he possessed with his mind to make people feel good about themselves in the beginning. And there was a charisma there. Yeah, there was a charisma there, and I wanted to be a part of that. Do you think he should ever be released? It would be a mistake if he were ever released. You think he is still a threat? Yes. Many Americans obviously worry that if you were released, that you would kill again. I know in my heart, I couldn't kill anybody today, tomorrow, next year. I could not do it. It's not in me. Did you or did you not? kill Sharon Tate? No, I did not. I thought you told me earlier, though, that why you felt so bad is that I was you're involved. craving forgiveness for what you did. I was involved. I was there. I participated. It's the same thing as actually taking a life in by law. Maybe I could have stopped it. I didn't. Why couldn't you speak up during the trial and say, I was there, I was part of it, but I didn't kill. The women in the Manson family at that point in time were expected to back the men. And for some reason, I felt it necessary to take blame upon myself. During the trials, though, you, you laughed at the system, you laughed at the victims. I think that I went along with the program that was laid out. Charlie's program? Yeah. Would you clear up once and for all what your account is? What actually happened? I was instructed to go to the Tate home. And I went into the Tate home. And I saw people brutally murdered. And I was instructed to kill two people. And I could not do it. I just, I couldn't do it. I think Susan Atkins is without a doubt the most dangerous uh, female criminal that I have met in 19 years in the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office. 
the bottom line was they killed her. They killed her and they killed her baby. And being the mother of this child, I am going to do whatever is necessary to see that justice is done. And to have them released and put out on the streets, there is no justice to that at all. It seems that she did do that. Um, in her mind, I think there's a bit of confusion. And yet I think she's living also, when she reflects on that, in a, in a dream world, the world of drugs and whatnot. Um, I suppose in my own heart, I, she probably did. Everything that I was told to do that night, I did with the exception of killing somebody. As incredible then, Susan, as your tale is, how do you convince anyone that you are now telling the truth? I don't know that it's important for me to convince anybody. I know that I live with the truth daily. Whether I killed somebody or I didn't kill somebody, I was there while eight people died needlessly, and I didn't do anything to stop it. That's what I live with, is that I didn't do anything to stop it. Yard of the California Institution for Women, West Los Angeles. And you're right, it looks like a junior college campus. But we were not allowed to photograph the 15-foot-high fences topped by rolls of barbed wire and guard towers. Between 900 and 1,000 women are serving time here, including Patricia Krenwinkel and Leslie Van Houten. For the last two years, Ms. Atkins has been allowed to mingle with the other inmates and now lives with other prisoners in one of the many cell blocks that the prisoners call cottages. She was escorted to the office of Assistant Prison Superintendent Don Williamson, who was present but off camera for the entire one-hour visit we were granted. Susan Atkins is now 33 years old, says she underwent a Christian conversion seven years ago, and says she was lying when she said she killed Sharon Tate, that co-defendant Charles Tex Watson actually did all the killing. Watson himself has testified he alone murdered all seven people. What went wrong with you as a teenager? Uh, I think the culture, the culture of uh, the 19, late 1960s, my desire to really look for somebody to love, um, I just got deceived. It's like kids my age, 18, 17, 18 years old at that time, with the drugs and the drug culture, it was an exciting thing, you know, and I just got caught up in it, got caught up and carried away. I think everybody that was into the drug scene in the late 60s was really looking for acceptance and love and wanted, uh, they were tired of double standards, they were tired of hypocrisy as I was, and they wanted truth. Well, truth is, has been said, it's relative to what you want, but there is a real truth. I just got caught up in a big lie. It looked good, it sounded good, it felt good, but uh, it's ki I kind of liken it to the story of Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs where she ate an apple and the apple really looked good, but there was that one drop of poison inside that apple and it destroyed her. You know, well, with me, with the drug scene, it looked good, it tasted good, but it was poison to my mind, it was poison to my system, and it very, very much destroyed my early youth, my 20s, all through my 20s. In prison, you said, gee, I stabbed Sharon Tate. Yes. I killed these people. Yes. And you were proud of it at the time. Yes. I think you need to understand my need to be accepted in the prison system. Uh, I was very frightened. I was barely 20, 21. I was frightened. Um, it was a means of defending myself, of appearing to be really tough and really strong. Because I did not kill anybody, I had, if you can understand this warped thinking, I had deep guilt feelings because I did not do what I was told to do with my peers at that point. And so I had guilt feelings, so I tried to make up for it and make myself to be really big, something really hard. I glorified crime. All that helter-skelter business? Yeah, or? yeah, it 
was it was all crazy, and I just I glorified it in, in my role in it. I didn't see the interview about a month ago or so, but uh, Charlie Manson was interviewed on television. Did you happen to see that interview? No. 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 I didn't either, to tell you the truth. Uh, what do you think about Charles Manson? I don't like to talk about him. He's part of my life that I wish never had happened. And I just, I can't talk about Does he about control him. you? No. Thank God, no. Not at all. No. I think some, only... some people are worried, though, that if you got out, that it would be this all over again. I've not heard from him or communicated with him in any way, shape, or form. I have made it absolutely clear I want nothing to do with him, ever. I made this clear seven years ago. I made it a matter of public record in my book. Um, I pray for his soul. And it takes a lot of strength for me to even do that, to really be able to pray for his soul. Since you found uh, Christianity, and, you, and you've talked to God and prayed to him, do you think he has forgiven you? Yes. Yeah. Yes. The, uh, there's a song I heard some time ago that the one line says, There is no sin that you could imagine that is greater than God's love to forgive. And that there's nothing that I could ever do in life that could be greater than God's love to forgive me. And that the blood of Jesus Christ shed at Calvary was as much for Susan Atkins as it was for Ronald Reagan. There's only one reason I want out of prison, and that's to serve my Lord Jesus Christ in whatever capacity he has called me to. And I believe he's called me to serve him as being Donald's wife. Susan, when people see that, what you just said, on television, whether it's in Texas or California, some of them are just going to stand up in their living room and say, that girl's nuts. Who's she fooling? Everyone is entitled to their own opinion. And I know that I stand before my God, and He knows my heart. And that's really all that matters to me. Two things, that God knows my heart and knows I didn't kill anybody, and Donald Lee Leisure Sr. knows my heart and knows that I didn't kill anybody, and that's all that matters to me. Would you admit that you've had some mental, some psychic, psychiatric problems over the past 10 years? and? Yes, I you can will, look back on it and agree admit, with that. I will admit to you 100% that I was as crazy as a loony too when I came into this institution. And I know that I know that I've had a deep healing in my mind and in my heart in the last seven years. And You're coming up again for parole this September. What? How do you assess your chances this fall? Um, I have no, I have no illusions about the parole board's position in giving me a parole date, and I do not expect a parole date at this time. Not from the parole board of the state of California. You've been in prison now for about 12 years. Yes. Do you think that you have paid your debt to society? Do you think you should get out? Do you think maybe you could do a couple more years? What's your feeling? Um, for the crime that I'm here for and for the actual factual part that I played in my crime, I have done far more time than, um, than I think I should have done because um, it's no secret my co-defendant uh, has exonerated me from actually taking anyone's life. I'm here because I lied. I'm here because I was an accessory to murder. As far as pain, there's no way. I have, I, I guess, Chip, I have two feelings on it. One, for, the, for what I did in the case, I've done enough time for my participation in helping nine people lose their lives. There's no way. There's no amount of time, there's no amount of money that can bring back those people. 
There's no amount of time or money that can pay the families of the victims or the families of the people involved in the case for those deaths. You know? uh, and so I have, you have to understand, I yeah, have a I lot see. of, it's very painful for me to talk about it. I don't like to talk about it because nobody knows what I feel inside yeah. about it. You, do you remember it all happening, though? I mean, Vividly. Yeah, and I will be glad when the day comes when I won't be able to remember. And I don't know if that day will ever come. Maybe you think Don could help you uh, oh. start anew and, and put that behind you? Yes, I do. I certainly do. OK, we uh, brought along a uh, videotape of a message from him to you so we could show that to you here at the prison. Oh. So stand by and we'll get that set up for you. Okay. I love you very much, Susan, and I have two things as a total commitment in life. To get you out on executive clemency at the White House level so we can circumvent the state of California on it because I think you've been a scapegoat, and that's my honest opinion. And the other thing is I love you with all of my heart and soul. And God willing, why, we're both going to make it. I want to see you free on the bricks. Is that the man you remember, the man you want to marry next month? Absolutely. I swear to God, I love her. I'm in love with her. I always have been for 15 years, and she has been with me. And we want to get married, and I love her, and that's all, that's all I want to do. That's my primary commitment to life, getting married to her, having children with her, and getting her out of executive clemency. The girl who was smiling in the courtroom those eerie smiles. Was that a sane person? No. With as much... It, it's, you know, it's really difficult to go back to that. But again, for the people who believe that in order to be able to do monstrous things, you have to be a monster. That's simply not true. That is simply not true. She asked me about the baby. You know a person by their behavior. And my behavior in this, in, in this institution speaks to the change that occurred over 30 years ago. I'm not the same person that I was when I came in here. Do you expect to be out someday? I would like to be out someday. I hope to be out someday. And it's amazing that I still have hope I don't know about expectations anymore. And Charles Manson himself has said, I didn't make them do anything. They did what they wanted to do. They did what they mm -hmm. had inside them to do. It's mm -hmm. who they were. I never told anybody to do anything other than what they wanted to do. And if they wanted to do murder, that was okay with you? That was none of my business, woman. I'm a convict. I'm an outlaw. I'm a rebel. I'm not a Sunday school teacher. I can't answer for what Charles Manson says. I don't know anymore what is in his mind. One time I asked her why she keeps trying, and she said that she knew that she couldn't change public opinion. But that's not why you do good things. That's not why you try to help people. Who's, who's had the most parole appearances in the room? Anybody got a shot? <laughs> Sharon Tate's father, Paul, wrote, 31 years ago, I sat in a courtroom with a jury and watched with others. I saw a young woman who giggled, snickered, and shouted out insults. Even while testifying about my daughter's last breath, she laughed. What argument can you make to him? There is no. There's only the continued attempt to apologize to him. Every time I've gone to the board, I've made every attempt possible to apologize. Remorse and sorrow for hideous actions is not calculatable. It, you can't calculate it. It's not something that's tangible. What remorse is, is not sitting in a prison cell for the rest of your life crying over what happened and what you cannot change. Remorse is genuine repentance, turning away from behavior, 
I know you don't say his name, but when you hear the name Charles Manson, is there something physical that goes on inside you? Yeah. Yes. It's, he is the one person that, that is the most difficult person in my life to forgive. And I work on that. I don't want to live a life with any unforgiveness in it. So many people lost so much. The victims, the families of the victims, the families of the people who were involved, the community at large, the society at large. Everybody lost. Are you in contact with him? No. All I know is that he's lived his life unscathed with this. He hasn't been touched by this. And I'm very grateful for that. Do you think he knows? I don't know. I may never know.